Hello. Our story begins in the seas of sand on Tatooine. Jedi Padawan Ezra Bridger was tricked into this barren wasteland by Maul as an attempt to find Obi-Wan Kenobi. Ezra had no chance of finding the Hermit who avoided the entire Empire for nearly two decades, and neither did Maul, which is why Maul used Ezra to lure Kenobi to him. It was a simple task, but little did Maul know that Obi-Wan bit the bait intentionally. He knew one of two scenarios could play out, and each of them respectfully would bring peace to their age-old rivalry. Two beings interlocked in a duel of the fates that they had no control over, something that was so far out of their hands that intertwined the two of them for a lifetime, respectfully, of suffering. Would Maul be able to see that they both suffered because of the same man, and the same torture Maul went through for so many years in the scrapyard was because of his master, instead of the Jedi Padawan defending his life? That much was unknown, but Obi-Wan gently approached young Ezra Bridger and explained the situation to him. Ezra was genuinely very apologetic. But Obi-Wan assured him that if he didn't want to be found by Maul, that he wouldn't have been seen at all. Maul was trying to end something he legitimately couldn't control. When Maul showed up, Ezra was sent away, despite his pleas to want to help Obi-Wan. The aging Jedi Master told Ezra there'd be no reason to fear what became of him. Maul stood above Obi-Wan, holding some sort of high ground in his own mind. It wasn't much, but in his own mind he felt truly empowered by it, though it meant nothing to Obi-Wan. It would end in one of two ways. Maul attempted to rip Obi-Wan away from the light, but he was the strongest willed person, literally ever. No wonder Maul had such a disdain for Ahsoka. She had it too. Wonder where she learned it. Kenobi or Skywalker. Maul's frustrations boiled as he splashed sand into the fire pit. He demanded a fight, and Obi-Wan was saddened that it would end like this. Perhaps there was another way. There was always an alternative means to combat. The two of them readied their stances, preparing for the lightsaber duel of their lifetimes. Both of them aged into their fifties, both of them with nothing left to fight for. Maul with no family, not Mother Talzin, no sisters or brothers, Obi-Wan, no Jedi Order and no apprentices. It was all on the line here. At least that was what Maul thought. Obi-Wan and Maul showed off. Kenobi started it in his traditional Form 3, and very similarly to how he played Vader, he switched into Form 4. It couldn't be that easy. Surely it couldn't be. Maul recognized the style. It was the same that Kenobi used on Naboo. It wasn't even his strongest form. Even more than that, he was holding the blade like Qui-Gon did before his death. Confidence rose within Maul, and after a small starter step, it was stripped away from him in three swings. Two parries and a direct hit. However, Obi-Wan was inclined to spare Maul's life. He hoped for Maul to have a chance at renewal. Maul looked down. Obi-Wan's blade was at Maul's chest. The heat radiated off the weapon, but it did not contact his skin. It didn't even penetrate the surface of Maul's cloak. How could this be? Kenobi had a direct hit and he pulled back. A moment so short. Something like a flash in the pan for the lives these two lived, and yet for Maul it did something so incredible. It took him on an emotional pod racer. He was transported through every memory before him. His blade slowly drifted into the sands and his legs felt weak under him. All of his power, all of his strength, all of his suffering was for nothing. It all clicked, and yet he couldn't imagine how to embrace a world without the dark side coursing through him. Maul's mind was transported to Dathomir. From there he saw the place he spent decades of his life, training under Sidious. He saw Naboo in Qui-Gon's dead body before darkness, before he was left to rot in the trash like a lifeless speck of dust amongst the stars. The memories of his brother and his return to Mother Talzin. The memory of Death Watch and taking Satine's life, only for his brother to be taken from him mere hours later. It was all poetry and it rhymed as such. Maul's fall to the rise of Crimson Dawn and the duel on Mandalore before Order 66. After that, his criminal empire and Kira before Sidious took it all away from him as he languished on Malachor for how many years until he found Ezra, his only hope for a friend, companion. Maul fell to his metallic knees, their sharp edges cutting through the soft sand. Obi-Wan de at his weapon. Maul's lightsaber was of no use to him. He looked up and asked Obi-Wan, what was it for? Why do they fight for so many years? The fragility in Maul's voice could cut through glass, and for a man who caused Obi-Wan nothing but pain, he understood. More than Maul could even conceptualize in this moment, he understood. Maul looked up and watched as Obi-Wan knelt down beside him. The former Sith asked why he didn't kill him, asked why he didn't take his life. Kenobi had it within an inch of his grasp, and he pulled up. Was it weakness or strength? So much Maul didn't understand, and his heart felt weak in his chest. Obi-Wan placed his hand gently on Maul's shoulder and told him, nothing in life is ever worth revenge. A flash of memories present in Obi-Wan's eyes, seeing the pleasure Maul took in each life he took from him, feeling Qui-Gon's body go limp in his arms and feeling Satine's warm hand against his cheek fall into still coldness as it fell lifelessly to her fallen soul. Obi-Wan looked to the side and then back to Maul, who couldn't muster the strength to say a word, let alone look Obi-Wan in the eyes. 
for a lifetime of misery he caused to the former Jedi. The one moment everything was his for the revenge, he still showed strength, resilience. He pulled up. How could this be? Ogwen told Maul that everything that was done to him hurt, but everything Maul went through hurt him too. Maul didn't understand, but Obi-Wan continued. He told Maul that they both suffered enough. They both ate away in their pain and crumbled into oblivion multiple times. What or who hurts you cannot be controlled. How you respond to such hurt can be. Obi-Wan looked at Maul and told him that he didn't believe killing Maul would solve anything. It would only let Maul experience peace for a solitary moment before silence. The peace he yearned for wasn't where Palpatine told him it was, rather it sat in the brotherhood of his eldest rival. Kenobi suggested that hurt individuals often hurt others as a mean to fill a void in their own souls. Oftentimes a void is never filled, and they are left to continuously try to take. Resilience isn't easy, and it never was supposed to be. Obi-Wan kept his hand gently placed on Maul's shoulder and told him that he never blamed him for what he took. His master, his love, they were all taken by Maul, but the circumstance of why Maul took them wasn't his own. Maul shook his head, he pleaded an apology, but it was dismissed respectfully. Obi-Wan told Maul that he still remembers the village that he came from. The moment Obi-Wan stepped into that hostile environment, he understood the depths of which Maul had transcended. Only from that village did he get placed at the feet of the most evil being the galaxy had ever seen. Maul reached back out, he grabbed Obi-Wan's wrist, and looked into his eyes and tried to organize any attempt at a true apology. His dark and corrupt heart couldn't muster the words nor the strength to invoke that apology. Obi-Wan shook his head. He told Maul that the corrupt mind serves the will of his torturer. When one breaks free from their servitude, then they can evoke their truest desires. Maul told Obi-Wan that the people he took can never be brought back. He took two precious lives away from Obi-Wan, and what was it worth? Obi-Wan would never have them back in his life. Can it be thought for a moment? The first time he got to interact with Qui-Gon was very so similar to the first time he encountered his Force Ghost. A moment of blissful confusion completed with a new joyous endeavor. Qui-Gon was always with Obi-Wan, and that would never change. When it came to Satine, it was star-crossed lovers or twin flames or soulmates. The first time they met, they'd known each other for an entire lifetime, and that was the same for their last goodbye. She may have never been able to come back and say hello quite like Qui-Gon, but she always existed in Obi-Wan's heart, and she always would. No matter the closeness of their adolescence or the distance in their adult life, their souls were intertwined indefinitely. Obi-Wan smirked briefly, and told Maul that taking them was painful, but they were never gone, just like Savage. Maul looked up in a confused manner, so much pain, hesitancy, optimism, and sorrow coursed through his heart. Obi-Wan patted Maul gently, and then pointed to his chest. Obi-Wan looked in Maul's eyes and told him that his brother was always with him, no matter where he went, as long as he didn't hold on, Savage would still be with him everywhere. Maul didn't understand, and Obi-Wan explained it. To come to peace, to come to acceptance, allow those who've been lost to transcend all reality. To hold on keeps them grounded. It doesn't allow their soul to move on, whether they be alive or not. Coming to peace with it only allows him to carry his brother with him. Maul looked away, a tear sliding down his piercing yellow eyes. What was this feeling? This wasn't by any means normal pain. It was agony. It was acceptance. Maul turned back and wiped a tear from his face, pleading another apology. He told Obi-Wan how sorry he was for what he took from him, and Obi-Wan simply told him that he forgave him after he said goodbye. That very painful, slow goodbye to Satine, those moments of intense vulnerability in front of the man who stripped her life away. It was the most painful and agonizing moment of Obi-Wan's life at that point, but it was a moment that changed him for the better. He chose Satine over the darkness, over what he wanted to do so badly it saved him against Anakin and after Anakin against Vader years after Mustafar. Obi-Wan's lesson from the loss of his love was acceptance. He wanted to hold on forever, but that moment with her, those last words would forever stick with him. The only thing on her mind in those last moments of existence was telling him how much she loved him and how she always had. Obi-Wan's calmness and his peace with the deaths of those he loved brought Maul back to Savage's death. The words trickling out of his dying body. Savage only worried about being a worthy apprentice, for not being like his brother. The moment Maul realized this, his heart shattered in more ways than just one. He leaned over in excruciating pain. Maul lived with those words, but never truly lived with them. He spent the last two decades trying to exact revenge when his brother only wanted peace. Maul could never find that peace, and neither could Savage. Maul grabbed the sand in anger and in pain, and he wanted to reach into his rage just like Sidious manipulated him to. But he couldn't. This conversation, this moment with his rival, would be for nothing. Obi-Wan could very easily be as much of a brother to him as Savage, and yet 
Here he couldn't escape the implications of what he had become. He felt Oguin's hand on his back and he let go, a couple stray tears making their markings in the cold sand of the night as Maul scratched the words from his coarse throat, fiercely an apology to his brother, and then followed up with an apology to himself. He let his brother go and accept what he had become, but he too needed to forgive himself for everything he did. Obi-Wan could accept any apology laid before him, but Maul also had to forgive himself. After Maul's apology, the desert was filled with silence. Maul still leaned over, his head in his hands, and the man who could have killed him sat quietly next to him, just simply, peacefully waiting. It felt like an eternity, it could have been seconds or minutes, but Maul looked up and looked over at Obi-Wan. He wanted to say so many things, whether it be another wave of heartfelt apologies or a series of questions he didn't know the answers to, though the one question he would have never asked was given an answer. The two of them got to their feet. The tension that sat present in Maul's mind for decades vanished, as if it was never truly there, just another barrier created by the Sith something they would call weakness when in reality it was stronger than anything they could ever devise. Restraint, resilience, adaptability, and strength of heart and mind rather than strength and power. Maul didn't know what to say or do. He looked at Obi-Wan, hoping that the former Jedi Master would have the words to say. Without asking or saying a word, Obi-Wan opened his arms. A very unfamiliar territory for a broken individual and the two of them, rivals since they were young, enemies since their first encounter became brothers in a moment of peaceful solidarity. It was a short hug but it was the only warmth Maul had ever felt. The bond he felt with Savage was special, but it existed in the coldness of the dark side. This right here was rooted in peace and in compassion. Obi-Wan had been here before. He walked this line before with the former third sister in these very sands nearly a decade before. Now Maul was here. He asked Obi-Wan what he should do now, and Kenobi turned towards the horizon and told Maul that the future was always at play. What he did with it was up to him and what his heart wanted him to be. Maul asked if he could stay on Tatooine with him. He didn't want the coldness anymore. He didn't want to abstract reality. He wanted to find peace. He no longer wanted to be a nomad, but he didn't want to hurt Obi-Wan if his presence was painful. Obi-Wan thought for a moment. As Obi-Wan had said, he came to peace with the past. It still hurt, and it flared up from time to time as old scars do, but they didn't prohibit him. They didn't control him. He made his peace with what came and went, whether it be nightmares or memories. His only fear was the protection of Luke. Maul mentioned the protection of someone before the duel began, and while Obi-Wan wasn't exactly inclined to trust Maul, despite his ability to forgive him, he considered what having Maul on Tatooine would mean for Luke. There wasn't necessarily anything that could lead Maul to Luke. Obi-Wan's residency was a bit of a ways away from the Lars homestead, so it would be reasonable to say the least that he wouldn't find him. He looked back at Maul, and then placed his hand on his back and nodded his head with a smile. Maul looked at the ground and saw his lightsaber on the ground. He asked Kenobi if he could bury the blade in the desert. Obi-Wan shook his head while packing up his materials. He told Maul that he needed to bring it with him to his home. Maul was a little surprised by this, but he accepted it. And they, after a few short minutes, made their way across the desert. Maul was famished by the time they got to the homestead, and he was given some water and some food by Obi-Wan, before he was left in a near comatose state. The pain he felt, the confusion along with the numerous days wandering around the desert, really put him in. Part of Obi-Wan wondered if Maul would attempt to kill him in his sleep, but it was just a feeling with Maul. There was something so obviously different about him now. Out of curiosity, he used the force to feel into Maul's mind, and what he saw only broke his heart more. The events of the last couple hours had affected Maul. Aside from wandering the desert, he had only interacted with Ezra and Kenobi. The dream went as such. Maul stumbled in the desert and fell. He was exhausted. The twin suns beat down on his black robes, which absorbed all of the heat. As Maul fell, he uncovered the sand and saw a horn. He began to pull sand back frantically, calling out his brother's name, and revealed Savage's head. It was buried in the sand and so was the rest of his body. As Maul uncovered him, he called out his name, terrified that he was gone, and yet this didn't elicit a single response. Maul grabbed onto his brother's arm and apologized for having led him astray, for allowing the magic in the dark side to lead him to his death. Savage's eyes jolted open, his large hands gripped Maul's wrist, and Savage looked at him with incredible sorrow. Savage asked that Maul only forgive himself. Maul asked what that meant, but as he asked, Savage faded into the sands within Maul's hands. A wave of terror covered Maul's face. The pain he felt was taken away by a heart-wrenching sound of a gasp. Maul knew the sound. When he heard it for the first time, he took pleasure, but this time he looked up and saw Satine on her knees in the desert sands. Maul launched himself forward without realizing that in the dream world, his legs had been replaced with his original set. 
He slid across the sand, burning up his calves as he got to Satine, holding her in his arms. As she slid in and out of consciousness, he begged her not to let go. He pleaded with her and that he could make things right, and then he heard anger burst out of Obi-Wan. Maul turned around to see a man with thick brown hair and pieces of clone trooper armor. Anger was all across his face as he yelled out Maul's name. The lightsaber swung down and Maul jolted from his sleep. His heart pounded and he searched the room. He remembered how he got here, but he also didn't. He looked around for Obi-Wan, but he couldn't see him. The residency was dark, so he simply tried to feel through the force. He could feel Obi-Wan's presence. It eased his mind, as he sucked on air. His breath was heavy. He slid back down to the mattress he was on, taking deep breath after deep breath. Anxiety rolled over his skin, but he mellowed out. He slowly drifted back into sleep. When Maul woke up later, it was daytime, and Obi-Wan was out and about. As the day got started, Maul asked Obi-Wan about bringing peace to himself and to his crystals. Obi-Wan told his new ally that they could resolve that, but it would take time and patience. As eager as Maul was to go back on what he did, it would take dedication for the Force to accept what he had done and forgive him. Or, in other words, for him to truly come to peace and forgiveness with himself. Obi-Wan would begin these lessons and continue to teach them to Maul as best he could. The best part about teaching these to Maul is that he was old at this point, and he had maturity and eagerness to reform himself, though these two former rivals would spend a lot of time around each other, which meant that when they were sent to Mos Espa and Mos Eisley to gather supplies, Maul learned that people called him Ben. Eventually, one day Maul asked Obi-Wan why they called him Ben, and he simply told Maul that it was a nickname Satine gave him when they first met. She always had cutesy nicknames to give out to people that she loved. Her sister Bo had one, and Obi-Wan did too. No one else shared that same affection with Satine. As if Maul didn't feel guilty enough, when he learned of this, it broke his heart even more. That was the reason Obi-Wan said that she was always with him. It's because every time Obi-Wan went down the town, people called him by the only nickname he'd ever been given by Satine. It was like Satine was speaking to him from the Force. Over the coming days and soon to be months, Maul would learn a lot about coming to peace with himself. It would be difficult, like giving up betting or putting down the drink. It wouldn't be easy. The habit of the dark side was fueled by pain and it relished in the risk of reward, which didn't always really come that easily. The light wasn't easy because languishing through the hard times but staying resilient wasn't supposed to be easy. Because the most growth happens when you're uncomfortable, and Maul learned all about being uncomfortable during this time. He learned what it meant to have true strength and resist the temptation in the pool to the dark side. It wanted him to remain comfortable in the uncomfortable, but every new day, Maul made it up to himself to be better than he was the day before. Every new day, he joined Obi-Wan with the promise to himself to be closer to the best version of himself than he was the previous day. Each day would have new practices and meditations that Maul would practice with Obi-Wan. During some of these meditations, they would either be separated or in the same shared space, drawing off of each other for a collective peace. In these shared meditations, Maul had to tell the deepest secrets about his life and Obi-Wan shared moments of his. Every day they got closer and closer to Maul removing the darkness from the crystals he had. About a year into having built a friendship, Maul removed the crimson glow from his lightsaber. He donned a cobalt blue blade like Ben did. Maul was given the choice to purify it like Ahsoka had, but he didn't want to. Obi-Wan knew how to do so, but he didn't believe it was a part of his journey. Maul wasn't specifically trying to emulate Ben, but he also didn't believe the purified crystal was a part of his path either. The day Maul purified his crystal was, for Maul, the greatest day of his life, and he couldn't think of anyone else to share it with other than his new brother. Maul was decidedly not a Jedi, but he most certainly was a practitioner of the light side, and renounced all of the darkness. There were still pieces of it, similar to what Anakin had at a certain period in his life, but none of it could break free. Maul made sure of that. Ben and Maul would spend the day in a cantina, listening to live music and enjoying each other's company. The path to forgiveness and openness allowed them to get this far. Truthfully, Maul had never felt so free and he expressed his joy to Ben, and it was reciprocated. Obi-Wan couldn't help but feel happiness for Maul. He'd been through so much and he finally got the chance to enjoy life on his own terms. It was a life-altering scenario for Maul and he relished it in its entirety. He had come to peace with his past and let go of the ones he lost, especially Savage, while always keeping him close at heart, still loving his brother but accepting the reality of the situation and being okay that he had gone. The philosophy that Obi-Wan used to help Maul through it was to only enjoy that they were here, enjoy the memories that existed. Maybe Maul looked back at his time as a Sith with a little bit of cringe or distaste, but Obi-Wan said be thankful for all that they are. Without those memories of quirkiness or failure or absolute embarrassment, he wouldn't be who he was today without it. These lessons really hit home with Maul, and it helped him overcome his time as a Sith. Because a lot of his resentment towards himself was for things that in reality were simply out of his control. 
For someone like Obi-Wan who lost a student to Palpatine, he understood how corrupting Sidious could be. He certainly couldn't hold that against a child who was captured and tortured by him for a number of years. Something that drastically changed within Maul was his lack of interest in avenging his brother or seeking revenge against Palpatine. Yes, he did want to bring an end to the Sith, but not on Palpatine's terms. If he gave in to lust for power, the incurable itch of revenge, then he would never find satisfaction. So instead, he welcomed peace within himself. And as Ben always did, he trusted the will of the Force. Shortly after Maul healed his crystal, he learned about the Skywalker twins, and how they were the ones meant to bring balance to the Force. At least in Obi-Wan's mind, at this point, that was the truth. It was a hard moment for Maul, realizing how selfless Kenobi had become. He wasn't just one of the few surviving masters of the Jedi Order, but he kept close to him the children of his former student. It put into perspective everything Obi-Wan had taught him about life over the last year. Maul began to understand that what Obi-Wan taught him was a reflection of what he had taught himself. All the challenges Obi-Wan overcame the past couple years was a reflection that was gifted to Maul so that he could excel to a state of serenity. Maul never could understand how an individual who went through so much suffering because of so few people could hold on to the light and continue to inspire others. But that is a tragedy of Obi-Wan Kenobi. He was at peace with it. He loved Anakin and Padme, and he saw in doing this as an extension of them. Taking care of the twins, or at least watching over them, was finishing what both parents would have at the very least wanted or asked for. The brotherhood between Maul and Kenobi would continue to expand. They shared stories and talked about memories frequently. They never got lost in the past, but they always attempted to find a new way to understand each other and the Force. The irony is that they could very easily be soulmates or twin flames, of course in the platonic way. The opportunity for them to become brothers and find relation with each other was existent from their first encounter. Their souls were intertwined by the duel of the fates. Ever since that moment, they had several chances to find peace with each other. Maul never forgave Obi-Wan for removing his legs, and Obi-Wan never forgave Maul for killing his master. The anger Obi-Wan showed in their first encounter during the Clone Wars was a show of him holding on. It corrupted him and held him back in the moment. This went for Maul as well when he devised the killing of Satine. It was a back and forth struggle that could have ended in the desert, but upon forgiveness they were able to reach the purest form of their bond. They were always meant to have the chance to form this, and had Maul been a Jedi it's very likely this brotherhood would have been formed. In their elder age they became like old men, bantering about the best of things and the worst of things. As the second year passed by, the two of them really got to fully enjoy their friendship. They always worked on bettering themselves, and it consistently showed, especially for Maul and his draw to the light. After these two years, Ben would return to his residency with an unfamiliar face. Maul had never seen Luke, and he was very unfamiliar with Anakin. But when Obi-Wan called Luke by his name, Maul realized who he was. Luke had no idea who Maul was. He'd seen a shadowy figure a couple times, but never interacted with him. It was just Maul going from point A to point B, or meditating, or whatnot. But Luke was introduced to the Force, and Maul took inspiration from how Ben introduced it to who was likely the second most powerful being in the galaxy after Sidious. Maul didn't realize how truly talented the twins were, and so he kind of sat in, listening in the background while being present. Obi-Wan informed Luke that they would go and find Leia, and when Maul thought about questioning Ben on why the mention of Leia being his sister didn't come up, Ben gave him a look that said, not yet. Maul understood and didn't think about it any further from there. Obi-Wan planned on telling the two of them once they were together, but first they had to stop at Mos Eisley and find themselves a ride off world which took them to Han Solo. The man was a familiar name to Maul. He'd been mentioned about a decade beforehand by Dryden Voss, and after him, Kira. They both spoke highly in moderation of Han. He was an eager kid and he always seemed to have the best intentions of others in mind, even if he didn't show it. Maul knew this when Han introduced himself, but this high regard came from Kira. Han didn't deliver himself as such. He was a cool guy, no attachments, a smuggler, who pushed his boundary with even Jabba the Hutt, and overall had a charming personality. He understood why Dryden at the very least complimented Han. That was very uncommon of a thing for Voss to do. The group of them would take the Millennium Falcon to the Alderaan system, so they could give the plans to the Alliance or more so Bail Organa. On the way there, Ben began to show Luke how to use the Force, and Maul watched on amusedly. During their trip through hyperspace, both Obi-Wan and Maul felt a great shock through the Force. Something so dense and dark that it felt as if it could create a wound in the Force itself, something unseen in generations. They looked at each other. The look on each of their faces showed genuine fear and concern for whatever had just happened. Ben brushed it to the side as he realized Luke had picked up on it. 
As he walked over to him and continued his very basic instruction, Moe listened in until they arrived at a hyperspace into an asteroid field. With another shared look, Obu and Maul understood what the other did. Alderaan was destroyed by the Empire. They both knew that at the moment. As they followed a TIE fighter, they found themselves at a super weapon. It brought back a flash of memories for Maul. He remembered Sidious mentioning he wanted a super weapon. At the time, it seemed like delusions of grandeur, but now it was all too real. They were pulled into the Death Star by a tractor beam and once they were in, the group hid inside the smuggler's spots across the large ship. Once the Imperials searched the Millennium Falcon and considered it clear, they set up two troopers to protect it. This was an odd scenario to be in, but the group managed to escape from the Falcon and make their way for the hangar control room. Once they were in, they devised a plan to help and find the princess. Maul and Chewie would act as prisoners and go to the detention level, while Kenobi broke off from the main group and turned off the tractor beam. Both Maul and Ben were aware that Vader was here, which is exactly why they split up. Luke and Leia needed to survive, plus Obi-Wan secretly knew that Vader would come and look for him instead of Maul, so they split up. Inside the detention cell, a battle broke out. Maul, Han, Chewie, and Luke all knocked out the cameras and the few guards on duty. While Luke went to the cell, Leia was in to grab her. As they did this, Kenobi was able to deactivate the tractor beam so that the Falcon could escape. With Maul, the four rebels would be able to stand their ground against the strong troopers as they piled in through the elevators. Han, Luke, and Chewie put themselves in front of Leia's prison cell, and Maul waited outside the elevators, and when the stormtroopers piled in, he ignited his blue lightsaber and cut through them. The flashes of blue were remarkable, and the group of four of them watched in awe until he waved them over and got them inside of an elevator. On the other hand, Obi-Wan was facing off against his former pupil. Vader was being gentle in his pursuit of victory, but he was showing strength and patience. He wouldn't lose, not this time. As their duel continued, Han, Chewie, Leia, Luke, Maul, and the droids made their move for the Millennium Falcon. When Vader turned his head, he was very confused. If he knew the twins were his, he would have been even more confused. But this one smuggler brought a Wookiee who helped his former student survive the Trandoshans, his two twins, his protocol droid, and his astromech, and somehow brought Darth Maul and Obi-Wan Kenobi. What in the force was this? Obi-Wan didn't have to see Anakin's face to feel the confusion radiating off of him, but Obi-Wan didn't seize a moment. He could have struck down Vader, but he saw this as a teaching moment to give them a means to escape. Vader could undoubtedly pull the Falcon out of the air, so he sacrificed himself. Ben's body vanished into the force as he was struck by the blade. Maul knew in that moment that his friend, his brother, had become one with the Force. He couldn't really take it in as he turned to Luke, who cried out and began to fire away stormtroopers in a chase for revenge. Maul grabbed Luke's shoulder and told him to get into the ship. Maul used the Force to throw the blaster shots back into the stormtroopers before they boarded the Falcon and the vessel took off. When they made their escape, Luke felt terrible sadness, and Leia did too, but she comforted Luke, and Maul, on the other hand, couldn't process the moment. Nothing made sense to him, the moment felt so surreal. He knew how to act, he didn't chase revenge, he truly changed because if he hadn't, then he would have lunged across the room in an attempt to kill Vader, but that's not what he did. Instead, he ushered Luke into the Falcon and abandoned the space station. There was a little dogfight that happened before they jumped to the hyperspace and got to Yavin. When they arrived on Yavin, Maul ushered the kids, at least all of them aside from Chewie, was a kid in his eyes, out of the Falcon as he made his way to the forests. Leia turned and saw Maul moving in a defeated manner to the tree line. She wondered who he was. Obi-Wan never mentioned him before. Maybe they were longtime friends. Leia turned back and joined the Alliance in the briefing rooms, and gave over the information retrieved from Admiral Radis' flagship over Scarif. Outside, Maul stumbled into the trees. His heart felt weak and he looked up into the sky. When he called out the name Kenobi, it wasn't in rage, but this time in sorrow. His best friend, his brother, had died right in front of him. Maul fell flat into the ground, his eyes bubbled with tears. He called out Obi-Wan's name again. He asked why he did it. A stream of tears slipped from his eyes. Maul held his head in his hands. He wiped the tears away, but he couldn't dry his face fast enough. He choked on his words. He cursed himself. He blamed himself. There was an incurable guilt that accompanied the loss of Obi-Wan. He couldn't get over the fact that his entire life was spent hating a man who gave him more friendship than anyone had ever met in the span of two years. He couldn't escape that he only got two years with someone he considered his best friend, someone he considered to be a brother to him. Maul's heart sat in his stomach, and he bellowed out cries of agony. He held himself together in front of the twins, but now he had a moment to fully take in his loss. A moment to realize that they could never banter in the cantina again, or play around them to bock or meditate or share funny stories with each other. They were best friends for what felt like all of two seconds, and it was the best time of Maul's life. Maul wished he could thank Ben a million, no, a billion, or a trillion, or quadrillion times, but he was gone. Sure, he was one with the Force, but the pain was too much to bear. 
Maul thought about every memory their short time as brothers held. It was the most precious time of his life. He wished he could be angry at the galaxy or seek revenge, but he knew that's not what his brother would have wanted for him. Ben only wanted Maul to experience happiness, and he had it before it was savagely ripped away from him by Vader. Maul grabbed himself and held on for dear life, because if he journeyed back down the dark path, then everything he and Kenobi went through would be for nothing. All the time together becoming brothers would be thrown away in a matter of minutes for short-term relief. Maul didn't want that, so he leaned up against the tree and looked at the leaves tumble to the ground. Maul thought about the lessons shared to him by Ben, and he tried to replicate them. He tried to make it his current monitor of life. He stuttered over his words, he choked on air, and he came back to himself. Maul told himself that he was happy for the time he had with Obi-Wan as a brother. He's happy that they were brothers for a period of time rather than no time at all. He was grateful that they showed each other compassion and gratitude once rather than not at all. It watered his eyes and it closed his throat the further he went along, but he slowly etched himself along to coming to peace with the predicament. Maul was glad that Ben forgave him, and that his brother never turned a blind eye to him no matter what it was. He was proud to be a soulmate of Ben's, and he was able to accompany him through the last two years of the great adventure of his life. He was proud of them, for getting through so much adversity and finding the light. He was thankful that Ben showed him the light within himself, and then Maul was sitting on the desert in Tatooine. He was right here, where their bond started. The bond of brotherhood started with Maul in the same place, though he was wondering why they fought for so long. Maul put his hand on his own shoulder, and said the words that Obi-Wan said to him two years before. Nothing in life is ever worth revenge. The words circulated through his mind, and the moment where their friendship began is right where it said goodbye. Ben Kenobi was one with the Force, and Maul was going to have to be okay with that. As he sat in the silence, a voice called out to him from the tree line, and asked if he was okay. Maul kept staring straight, his eyes locked onto the painful hallucination of the day they became brothers. Remembering Obi-Wan's guiding smile and calm demeanor, it was a painful moment, but it was one that Maul was eternally grateful for. The voice that called out got a little closer, as a small hand laid itself on Maul's shoulder, and he looked over to see Leia's amber eyes staring back at him, asking him if he was alright again. Maul nodded his head, and he said that he would be. Leia got down on a rock next to him and asked him how he knew Ben Kenobi, and Maul smiled and said that it was a long story. She had a little bit of time to spare, and Maul knew that, so he told her everything briefly. She was both shocked, but also not at all. It sounded exactly like something Obi-Wan would do. It was the type of man he was, and Leia knew that. It was just so inspiring to see how Ben was able to forgive Maul for taking so much from him. Leia asked if he would like to come back to the briefing with her, and he shook his head. He told her that he may or may not have tried to kill General Sandula once or twice, and so he didn't really want to exactly amp her up at the moment. Leia told him that Hera wasn't here at the moment, but whenever he felt the time was right, he could come around and make amends. She would back him for being brothers with Ben. Leia got up and returned to the briefing room. Mo would stay in the forest until night, after the attack on the Death Star and the celebration that followed. He spent the entire time thinking about everything. His mind drifted from topic to topic until he got up and headed back. As he made his way through the base, his leg was shocked by an angry little goober. It was Chopper. Oh no. Hera was surely somewhere nearby, and he was right. So was Zeb and Callus. Maul put his hands up in the air and told him that he wasn't an enemy anymore. Zeb clapped his fists together and prepared to rip his arms off, as Leia came running out of the hangar bay. Hera was confused when Leia defended this man. She tried to tell Leia that Maul was a pathological liar. Oh well, that's something that he didn't really address earlier. Maul told them that he was going to follow the Force. He would finish what Obi-Wan couldn't. He expressed his apologies to Syndulla for blinding Kanan and threatening them and trying to kill them. He asked for a moment of their time to explain it. Hera crossed her arms and nodded her head, waiting for a good response. It better be good is what her face said to him. Maul told them about Ezra coming to Tatooine to find Obi-Wan, and well he did. And it was because of Maul. He continued to elaborate on the entire situation and told them how he got here. Maul noticed a wave of sadness cross their faces at the mention of Ezra, and asked where the boy was. They told him that Kanan and Ezra had sacrificed themselves for the people of Lothal, but not just them, but the people of the galaxy. Kanan stopped the TIE Defender program by sacrificing his life at the Field Depot, and Ezra took Thrawn away from the Empire. Maul expressed his condolences, and also how he was hoping to apologize to the group of them himself. He noticed the Mandalorian wasn't with them, and he was told that Sabine was still on the fall. Maul would spend the entire night sleeping outside the base, which is where he felt most comfortable at. In the morning, he found Luke and Leia and asked to speak with them. Having spent two years with Kenobi, he knew just about all there was to know about this family. He took the twins with him on a walk, mostly just a less populated area of the base, and he told them that Obi-Wan would have likely wanted to tell them, but there was something about the two of them that they needed to know. 
Their father was Darth Vader, and they were twins. Regardless of the delivery, it would have been a tough pill to swallow, and it was. He gave them a moment to really take in the words he just said to them. They stood quietly for a moment. They had a lot to take in. Leia definitely didn't care for Vader at all, and Luke had no real reason to like him either. After a couple minutes, Maul told the two of them that they were the children of Anakin Skywalker, and being that he felt the dark side, Obi-Wan was under the belief that maybe the prophecy didn't relate to Anakin, but actually his children. Of course, this was just Obi-Wan's opinion, and nothing was set in stone regarding it. Maul finished his statement in telling them that he was no Jedi, he had no intentions of becoming a Jedi, but he would be willing to train them in the ways of the Force. Their destiny lay ahead of them, and he couldn't force it onto them. They had to choose their path, and if they wanted to learn the ways of the Force, then surely he could give them a proper instruction. Luke looked at his sister, still holding onto his father's lightsaber on his belt, and he told Maul that he would like to. Leia looked over, and Maul split his weapon into two, and he reached out to her. She looked at the weapon, and then at her brother. She accepted it, and the two of them would begin their training with Maul. His perception of the Force would be incredibly unique, much more than anyone else the twins may have encountered. Their training would begin as quickly as they said the word. It would continue for the next three years. With the knowledge of Luke and Leia being twins, a foundational relationship would begin between Han and Leia, though it was as rigid as one might expect it to be. Luke and Leia spent a lot of time with Maul rather than going on adventures, which allowed Han and Chewie to develop a reputation within the Alliance, allowing them to become as recognizable as Luke, Leia, and Hera. During this period, Maul would have one encounter with the Force Ghost of Obi-Wan, and it was more or less Ben coming to tell Maul that he was alright and that everything Maul was doing was remarkable. Maul was very pleased with his visit from Kenobi, which thanks to Maul's presence, Ben had no real inclination to request that Luke and Leia go to Dagobah to visit Yoda. He believed that what Maul was doing would better suit the twins. Leia during the three years would construct her own lightsaber, and after his construction, she would give Maul back his own lightsaber. Luke would also do the same thing. In Maul's old age, he wasn't much of a combatant, but as a teacher, he thrived off of it. Originally, Maul hated the idea of being a teacher. When he taught Savage, he built a bond with being a teacher, and his intention of seducing Ezra to the dark side left him a little afraid to fill the role of teacher again. Ben knew this when he died, and so, when Maul was faced with the adversity of training the twins, he showed resilience and strength when it came to deciding to train them or not. Being that Maul was a talented duelist in his youth, he taught Luke and Leia how to adopt such powers, which went especially well for them. The twins were extremely talented naturally, but with a refined teacher who taught them, his mastered form, which was the most aggressive lightsaber form of combat, the twins very quickly became something even Maul in his prime would fear. As individuals, they were talented and powerful, but together, they were a response from the Force to the creation of Darth Vader, and they certainly lived up to it. Without a trip to Dagobah and after the Battle of Hoth, they would find themselves on Bespin, where Han and Chewie could repair the Falcon with the help of some of Lando's men. It was a bit of a convoluted event. They were followed by Boba Fett, and the Empire was actually on the planet, but with Luke, Leia, and Maul present, there was really nothing in reality for them to worry about. But with Vader present, they kind of did. There was a short exchange between the four of them, mostly Vader being confused on how Ben turned Maul to the light side of the Force and how Maul was seemingly training a new Jedi Order. It was a really bizarre thing to just encounter like that. But during the encounter, Luke did feel a bond with his father, Click. Vader had been trying to find Luke since the Death Star, and now he found him. With the other two duelists present, he couldn't get time with Luke alone. This, of course, being that Vader didn't know Leia was his daughter. As the twins and Maul escaped the clutches of Vader by blocking off his attack by bringing down a number of walls, the group returned to the Alliance fleet with one more ally, that being Lando Calrissian, who felt terrible about the whole operation. Luckily though, with all the Force users present, no one was captured by the Bounty Hunter or by the Empire. For the next year, the twins would essentially finish up their training as Yoda took his final breaths on Dagobah and became one with the Force. He knew from Obi-Wan that everything was under control, and he trusted the will of the Force. Four years after the Battle of Yavin and the beginning of Luke and Leia's training, the Alliance would have a chance to finish off the Empire. The second Death Star was being finished over the moon at Endor. If they could destroy that weapon, they could possibly kill the Emperor. Maul hadn't thought about cities at all during the duration of Luke and Leia's training. When he heard the Emperor mentioned, it threw him for a loop. He'd been so focused on the light for six years at this point that he didn't know how to think about the darkness. The Alliance devised a plan. Han and Leia, whose relationship was much deeper than surface level flirting, would be split up. Leia and Luke would go with General Maul to the Death Star, while General Calrissian would lead the fighter escort for the space battle. General Solo had control of the operation on the ground. With the groups paired up, they prepared for the final leg of their assault against the Empire. If they could win here, it was an avenue to the core. With everything prepared, they split up. General Solo's squad went first, 
Shortly after them, the Force users went to their infiltration on the Death Star. They were being escorted by a number of former Imperials who were now traitors that recently left the Empire. Their codes hadn't been compromised, by the way. Essentially, they drifted off and their ship lost power, in quotations. It was a story they prepared for the Empire. Nothing beats the classic story of bad odds against an overbearing power, but that's what the Rebellion's all about. From Rogue One to Rogue Squadron, from Ferrix to Endor, they would take the fight to the Empire. Solo's group would make an appropriate landing on the surface of the planet and prepare to take down the shield generator. As they did, Luke, Leia, and Maul infiltrated the Death Star. Vader and Sidious were there. And the moment Maul entered the station, Sidious knew that his former apprentice had found him after all these years. He also knew that Maul was alive because Vader was a little snitch. As Solo was able to knock down the shield generator, the Alliance arrived, that is, until a trap was sprung. Without the aid of the Ewoks, the Alliance had no means to defeat the Empire on the ground. They locked the manpower and they had to settle for an all-out defeat and surrender, which, without being able to communicate to the Alliance fleet, left them all in terror of what would become of the fleet. Thanks to Lando, the Rebels didn't attempt an assault on the Death Star itself when they arrived. Inside the superstructure, Maul led Luke and Leia into the throne room. The Royal Guards were ordered to allow them to enter without trying to fight. Sidious wanted to see his former pupil and his two new apprentices before he killed Vader and Maul in one moment of pageantry and victory. It would coincide with his victory over the Alliance. Perfect, as all things should be. Maul felt shivers crawl down his spine as they walked up the steps. He looked at Vader and then the Sidious. His arms stretched out, as a parent with their child, as he kept Luke and Leia away from this monster. Sidious called Maul weak once more. It's all he ever called Maul during his training, and he expected a reaction, but nothing came. A lifetime of torture sat between these two individuals, and Maul simply expressed his peace with the Force and his path as he pulled out his lightsaber and ignited it. Luke extended his own lightsaber, which held an emerald glow, while Leia did the same, unleashing a cobalt blue color. Sidious had no intention of worrying about this. He could kill them all if he wanted, but he also wanted Vader to work for a spot. Vader knew it too. He was here fending off his role as the Emperor's pet. These four duels played this game before. It was just a matter of who wanted to come out on top more. Who desired the victory of the light or the dark more? Maul and the twins spread out and Vader held his ground. The duel began and it was a flash of lights as cities watched and bemused. The duelists slashed their blades against the others, each of them trying to land the killing blow and yet none of them getting where they were hoping to. Luke through the duel started to feel a pull and he backed off. The stalemate ceased. Vader looked around confusedly. Maul stepped back. He knew Luke was up to something. He wouldn't challenge his intuition. He believed intuition was the key to the universe. Let Luke use his magic. Luke pointed the blade forward and asked his father if he really wanted to kill his children. Maul backed off and turned towards Sidious. He knew that his presence could interfere with whatever Luke was trying to pull with his father. When Maul turned around, he was greeted by the cynical grin of Sidious. The Dark Lord of the Sith rose from his throne and asked Maul if he had any intention of saying last words. After all, he might be able to say what his brother could not, considering Savage died so worthlessly, right? Just a waste of talent just like Maul, throwing in his lot with the Jedi. Maul closed his eyes and pulled his blade around the front of his face, the blue light emanating off his crimson skin. As his eyes opened, he looked at Sidious with a natural color in his eyes as he told him that he's not a Jedi. Maul lunged forward and Sidious had to move out of the way, not expecting the calmness of a collected Force user. Maul was careful on his feet, avoiding any chance to mess up, which is what Sidious was banking on, though it didn't come. Vader, on the other hand, was being tormented as Luke and Leia pinned their blades against his, telling him that their mother would have never stood for this behavior. It was cruel and unnecessary, but it actually was necessary. They crushed Vader with only insults that a family member could deliver. They heard Maul scream out in pain. His blade was thrown from his hands and he was on his knees. Sidious was blasting away with lightning. Vader looked at the twins. What they said was extremely hurtful. They told him how much of a failed father he was, how his actions caused the deaths of billions if not trillions, how their mother would have been so embarrassed because of him, how she would have fallen out of love with him if she knew any of this, and that turned out to eat away at him. Vader saw Maul suffering in pain, his skeleton being revealed by each blast from the lightning, that is until it stopped. Vader's blade crushed through Palpatine's back as Vader lifted his arm into the air throwing Palpatine's view into the ceiling before it all blacked out. The body fell lifelessly to the ground, and Vader looked down at Maul who was reeling in his pain. Vader turned around and dropped his weapon. He looked at the twins and told them that he knew they may never be able to forgive him, but for all of his failures, he would like to make things right. All he asked is if he could spare a moment to look at them with his own eyes. They nodded in agreement, and Vader removed his helmet and revealed the pale skin of Anakin Skywalker. He looked at them and spoke brokenly. He told them to never become victims of the dark side. He then apologized for missing out on every moment of their lives. 
Maybe in another life he can make it up to them. But for this life, he would at the very least like their future to be controlled by them, after he uprooted the foundation that he destroyed before they were born. He put the helmet back over his head and smiled under the mask with a tear in his eye. He told the three of them to abandon the Death Star now. As he turned, the few royal guards who had been waiting patiently ran up the stairs only to have their necks snapped under Anakin's twist. He stormed forward. Luke and Leia ran over to help Maul up. Vader saw it out of the corner of his eye, and it broke his heart. They cared for Maul more than they did him, but it was his own mistake. His choice and his sins to bear. Maul made a choice to change. Anakin did too. Only they made the inverse decisions. As Anakin walked to the elevator, he requested that his vest be prepared on the interior hangar bay of the Death Star. No one knew why, but why question Vader? He wasn't someone you wanted to say no to. Luke and Leia lifted Maul off the ground. His body was weak. His presence was shallow. They walked him over to the same elevator and the group of rebels who had been waiting for them got them and carefully took them back to the land of shuttle they arrived in. Anakin, on the other hand, called upon the operation room for the Death Star weapon and requested the deckhands to fire at the executor. He had information from Admiral Piet that the rebels had captured the vessel and were preparing to use it against the Empire. None of that was true, but it was from Vader and so they fired on the executor, ripping it from piece to piece and sending debris into the surrounding support fleet. The Imperial fleet was completely caught off guard by this, and they didn't know how to react or respond. At the same time, Anakin entered his TIE fighter and launched it into the construction shaft, and headed straight for the reactor. He knew in his heart of hearts that there was no coming back from what he'd done. He caused so much pain and death to everyone and anything that he couldn't be forgiven by the Collective Galaxy. But the Collective Galaxy wasn't what he cared about. He wanted Luke and Leia's forgiveness. And so, as a failed father, he believed his wronging to the galaxy wouldn't be forgiven. But by doing this, he could, maybe, just maybe, earn the love he wanted and yearned from his children. Anakin slid the TIE Fighter around the reactor shaft, and as he saw the reactor, he floored the speed on it, and Anakin closed his eyes. The last thought in his mind were Padme, Luke, and Leia, all standing in front of him, with his own eyes looking at them, and the life that he should have lived with them. A dream not fulfilled here, but maybe his kids could live in it. The moment his TIE Fighter slammed into the reactor, the superstructure began to collapse. As the Alliance won in space, reinforcements assisted Han and the rebels on the ground, wiping the Imperial forces from Endor and cementing their victory for the Alliance. As the celebrations began, Maul stumbled down onto the soft, mossy ground of the Endor floor. As fires burned and people celebrated the fall of the Empire, Maul felt the call to the Force. The twins guided him down near a quiet fire and he looked up, watching the Y-Wings fly over dropping fireworks. Maul smiled and leaned back on the ground, his head gently placed on Leia's lap. Han, Luke, and Chewie were all right next to him in his final moments. He smiled at the stars. He may have not been able to see the fall of the Empire, but he knew it was coming. Luke and Leia were the future, and in his eyes, they not only saved him, but brought balance to the Force. For a moment, one short, sweet moment, Maul looked up and felt peace to the Force. When Anakin died, he ended the legacy of the Sith. The Sith Eternal and Exegol were wiped from the galaxy and the Sith religion died on the Death Star. There was no fear for their return. However, the Jedi were dead too. Obun and Yoda were the last of their religion. Luke and Leia had the option to revive it or choose a new path. Maul thanked them for the journey of a lifetime. He thanked them for being with him for his final years of life and all the joy that accompanied their time together. He was always appreciative for them, and in one final breath, Maul felt the presence of his brother, his true brother, Ben Kenobi, who took him into the Force, allowing Maul to become one with the Force just like Anakin Skywalker. As the Empire began to crumble, their fate was sealed at Jakku. Luke and Leia would continue down the path Maul led them down, avoiding a connection to the Jedi or the Sith and beginning a new religion of Force users, taking attributes from both the Jedi and the Sith, but removing the corrupt aspects from both of them. Their order would welcome all into it, and would become a sign that the times had changed. As the New Republic rose in the ashes of the Empire, as did Luke and Leia's new endeavor, while Maul, on the other hand, would join his brother, Obi-Wan Kenobi, as they watched over their students' greatest adventures. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks to Galva Gaming, Darth Revan, Tristan, Pimp Daddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Mad Money Studios, Anakin003, Lemon Knight, Rex the Wolf, The Man with Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Flynn Vassis, and Lord Denwing for supporting the channel. Smash the like button if you want to see more mall content. If you want to support me in other ways, go check out the Patreon. Are you all crying? Because I almost am. <laughs> you know, I got this thumbnail the other day, and I was like, I gotta do this story. And I never realized it would be this emotional. 
and I really hope you guys enjoyed it because I put my heart into it as I do all the stories. But this one, this one is intentionally emotional, um, and, and it definitely comes off that way. First things first. Maul is Sisyphus. He's a Greek mythology guy, and that's that's the George Lucas arc, right? So Maul is Sisyphus. He's he's doomed to roll a st uh, roll a boulder up a hill, so he never gets to experience it. And so him dying at the end of Endor is the only thing that can actually happen for him in the arc that's created for him, right? And so his entire life is just rolling a boulder up a hill just to have it thrown back in his face. You see that with Death Watch, Crimson Dawn, whatnot. Uh, that's that's all that happens in Mullen. So I wanted that to be the inverse, but in a peaceful way. You know, he finally gets to have that moment where, where the galaxy can change, but he doesn't get to enjoy it. Kind of similar to Obi-Wan's arc and kind of similar to Luke's arc in Last Jedi, which is the inspiration he gives to the next generation, right? The inspiration his death has on the people that he cares about. Something that I put into the story that I really wanted to make noticeable but not too noticeable is how I mentioned Obi-Wan throughout the story. So you might have picked up on it first viewing or might not have, but I intentionally called Obi-Wan Obi-Wan for the first half of the story until Maul and him started becoming friends. And when they became closer friends, Maul referred to Obi-Wan as Ben. So that was a kind of cool little Easter egg I put in there. I wanted to play around with the idea of soulmates. Soulmates, twin flames, whatever, they don't have to be romantic. Because they don't have to be romantic, I thought it'd be really interesting to incorporate that soulmate kind of twin flame connection where Maul and Obi-Wan always had a chance to be brothers, but they always, always went against each other. And so I wanted I wanted each of their confrontations to kind of feel like they built up to this moment, this moment, especially on Tatooine, the moment where they became brothers, where they where they said, you know what, it's not worth it anymore. I know there's gonna be one comment that says, well, actually, and the truth is, I was going off the main thing that we see from Maul in Rebels. When he dies in Rebels, you see him start to let go. You see him start to let go. And I think if Maul continued down that path, he could have let go. And that's what the scene on Tatooine is all about. It's all about him letting go and actually being able to fully let go. However, he doesn't get to fully experience letting go. That's because he's Sisyphus. He doesn't get to fully experience letting go of it. And so he's always burdened with it, you know. That's why he loses Obi-Wan. You know, that's why he's faced with the challenge of having to fight Vader without turning to the dark side and having to face Sidious without turning to the dark side and having to surrender himself to Sidious and to Vader to not turn to the dark side. And then also for Vader and Anakin, I didn't want Anakin to just be like, oh, mega cool guy gets to do a cool thing and come back and be super cool with everybody. That doesn't really work when you're a war criminal. Most war criminals don't really get to like do that and then be like, oh, by the way, I just want to do it for funsies because my wife is going to die and I actually killed her. Kind of technically, you know, it's a technicality, but essentially I'm saying Vader's not going to get off easy, Anakin's not getting off easy, so he might as well take it himself. He might as well have his own way to say goodbye, and having his own way to say goodbye is taking out the Death Star, and that's why the whole Alliance operation on the Force Moon didn't work. I took Leia off, and I thought that would be kind of cool little interesting plot point. We never really seen that before, where Endor's operation didn't really go well and the Death Star shield was still up. Sure, there's a separate video there, but anyways, I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you did, smash the like button. I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the Force be with you.